Uh, so we're talking about um, Christianish. That's the title of this series. Listen, uh, as a high school teacher, there's a question that I'm asked all the time. There's a few questions I'm asked all the time, but probably the one question that I answer more than any other is students asking, where should I go? I teach juniors and seniors in high school, and so their question is, you know, should I go to this university, to that university? Um, does this school have the, a good program for this or for that? And when I'm dealing with Christian students, the logical question that I get asked a lot is, should I choose to go to a state university or should I go to a Christian university? And I will say, um, used to be a really easy answer for me. Used to be an easy answer because I had an incredible experience at a private Christian institution. And so it was always just a, a look, if you can do it and you can go to one of those, go there. Uh, professors that pray with you, chapel services that you can attend. My biblical worldview was shaped largely during my undergraduate years at college. Now, in the intervening time, I've seen a drift, and we've all seen a drift, in, in many Christian institutions, and it's caused me a little bit of pause before I say, yeah, you, you ought to go there, you ought to do that. But listen, there's still a lot of great Christian schools that are out there. The real reason that I now hesitate whenever I'm asked this question is because I started asking myself this. If I was Satan, where would I attack? If I was Satan, where would I win my battles? Am I going to win my battles against Christianity at a state university where I have Christian kids that are going there and they've been told what to expect? They've been prepared for it. Their radars are up. They know that God is going to be mocked. He's going to be, uh, he's going to be silenced or ignored. And so they're anticipating it. At a Christian university, though, if I could find a way to worm my way in, to infiltrate what's going on there. They're training the next generation of Christian leaders and teachers and, and preachers and professionals. If I could somehow weave in New Age teaching, I could trust that those students there don't know the Bible well enough and they can't discern it. They don't test everything that they're hearing against the authority of Scripture. It's wrapped in Christian clothing and boom, I've got them. Because whatever they hear, they know, well, this has to be Christianity because I'm at a Christian institution. And I've seen that play out. Kids that I felt were so well-grounded go to Christian schools and come away embracing a lot of philosophy that is anything but biblical. So that's why I've got pause. Well, I'm going to tell you that as I prepared this, this uh, series, it's the same principle that I see with the local church. If I was Satan, where am I going to win my battles against the Lord? Where am I going to win my battles in this culture? Am I going to attack the culture that I've already won? Of course not. I'm not going to go after Hollywood. I've already got them. I'm not going to go after the television elites. I'm not going to go after the media. I've already won them. If I really want to undermine what God wants for his world here in America, you know where I'm going to go? I'm going to infiltrate his greatest weapon, which is the local church. That's where I'm going to go. That's what I'm going to do. I don't know if you've ever tried to kill a rat. Not that I'm analogizing us with rats, but it's happening, so just go with it. Um, if you've ever tried to kill a rat and you've laid out decon, you know what decon is? It's not 100% poison. If it was 100% poison, the rat's never going to touch it. He's not an idiot. I mean, he's a rat, but he's not an idiot. It, it, what decon is, is 99.5% really good stuff, and it lures the rat in. But it's 0.5% super toxic poison and the rat doesn't know that he's getting the super toxic poison because he's lapping up the 99.5 percent and it's the same principle with the local church we have so many churches that seem so well grounded and they're preaching so many wonderful things 99 percent of what is being taught and preached is great but then there's that one percent and that one percent is enough to undermine listen this this is why this series because satan's efforts in this regard to slip some decon to all of us in the church, it manifests in what I call Christianish. And so that's what this series is. Christian churches are the Lord's greatest tool. It is his greatest weapon against Satan. It's a thorn in Satan's side. But a Christianish church, of which there are many in American society and culture today, that's one of Satan's most effective tools. So how do we distinguish between them? How do we know the difference between a Christian church and a Christianish church? 
three weeks, ten characteristics. We got this week, and then next week will be the last week. I have to be going, and I'm so excited. I'm in Alaska next week, so I will not be here, but I'm here this week, skip a week, and then we've got the last two uh, of this series. Okay, so I'm going to go through that again. This week, skip next week, and then we'll hit the last two. So four characteristics today, skip a week, and then four characteristics, and then we'll finish off with two. Everybody got that? It's on your bulletin. Make sure you memorize it. Great. So three weeks, ten characteristics. And let's get started. Get your notes out. Get a pen or a pencil out. You need to know and distinguish because if you're hearing what a Christianist church is and you see it in this church, then I'm going to encourage you, and the elders are going to love this, get out the door and never come back because it's that serious. Characteristic number one of a Christianist church. Here we go. A Christianist church teaches about the Bible. The Bible is treated as a book of moral life lessons. It's used anecdotally to encourage self-help or self-empowerment. The historical accounts of the text are often dealt with as fables. You know, maybe instead of Jesus working a literal miracle in terms of breaking the bread and having it, you know, actually him multiplying the bread until it was overflowing 12 baskets afterwards, Maybe what happened was when people saw the boy share his food, then everyone else decided to share their food. The Bible is used as tales of wisdom to help highlight or reinforce some important truth, a truth that could be known apart from Scripture. All right, so characteristic number one of a Christianist church, you just heard it, we teach about the Bible. Okay, there's a difference between teaching the Bible and teaching about the Bible. The Bible is a book of moral life lessons. Maybe these are historical accounts, but maybe not. And it really doesn't matter. In other words, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, okay, maybe Jesus did that, but probably not. That's, that's kind of silly. But it doesn't matter whether he really did it or not. What matters is it's about us sharing. And David and Goliath, it seems a little odd that a dude would be that big and that he'd be killed by a little boy. With a, It's a great story, but don't get caught up on whether or not it's true. That doesn't matter. What matters is that it's about us conquering those things in our life that seem to be challenging. We all have our own personal giants, our own personal Goliaths, so you can kill your Goliaths too. And the, and the Good Samaritan, that's about us caring for the needy. Do you notice a common theme in what a Christianist church is going to teach? Do you see the common theme there? Because I'm going to highlight it for you. It's all about us. In other words, the Bible becomes like Aesop's fables. A bunch of stories that are probably not true, but the whole point is to teach us a good moral lesson for the way that we live. In other words, we're the center of the story. But we are not the center of God's story. God is the center of his story. We are not the stars of this show. We are here to bring attention to the star of the show, which is God. God performed the miracle to feed the hungry. God is the one that took down Goliath to spare Israel. God is the one who lovingly rescued the beaten and the downtrodden and rescues the beaten and the downtrodden today. That is the, what, what a Christian... You see, a Christian church shatters all of this. A Christian church doesn't teach about the Bible. A Christian church teaches the Bible. What do we teach the Bible? We teach that it is inerrant. It is without error. You will not find error in the Bible. And if you think you have found error in the Bible, there's an error in your head, and you need to figure out what you're doing wrong. We teach that the Bible is sufficient. It alone is all you need. You do not need the Bible and some additional book added to it to help you understand what truth is. What did Jude say? We have the faith that is once for all entrusted to the saints. It's all you need. It is sufficient. It is clear. We don't need somebody to tell us what it means. Jesus' teachings are apparent to every single one of us. It's the priesthood of all believers. We don't need a pope to tell us this is what you should think about what the word says. You have the word and it's been entrusted to us. We have it. And the Bible is authoritative. It is over all things. It is the final authority over all things. Uh, this is probably my weird thing, and you're going to think I'm a lunatic, but I love communicators. I, I do. I've always wanted to be a good communicator, and so if you want to be good at something, then what do you do? You study people who are good at that something. And so I've always been fascinated with the way people speak and the way that they teach, and I've always wanted to learn. Well, a couple months ago, some folks came up to me and said, have you ever heard Andy Stanley preach? If you don't know who Andy Stanley is, he, he leads uh, North Point Church. It's a huge mega church. He is the son of Charles Stanley, who was a famous... Baptist minister, and, and Andy is kind of over, well, he hadn't kind of, he has overtaken his dad as far as fame and reputation. 
I had these people say, Andy Stanley is an incredible communicator. You really ought to listen to him. So for the last few months, I've been listening to Andy Stanley. What I found is Andy Stanley says a lot of stuff that I'm sitting there saying, I'm not sure I'm completely on board with this. I don't know that this sounds right. And then whenever I see that controversy, Andy Stanley's response is, well, y'all just didn't understand what I was saying, which is weird to me because I thought he was a fantastic communicator. So I need to make up my, why am I watching this guy who's a great communicator if he seems to be miscommunicating all of these points? That doesn't matter. Andy Stanley said this recently about the Bible. I want you to listen. Because many have lost faith. Many have lost faith because of something about the Bible or in the Bible, the Old Testament in particular. Once they could no longer accept all the historicity of the Old Testament, once they couldn't go along with all the miracles, once somebody poked a hole in the Genesis creation you know, myth, once all that went away, suddenly their house of cards faith came tumbling down because they were taught it's all true, it's all God's word, and if you find one part that's not true, uh-oh, the whole thing comes tumbling down. Not Christianity. The Bible did not create Christianity. The resurrection of Jesus created and launched Christianity. Your whole house of Old Testament cards can come tumbling down. The question is, did Jesus rise from the dead? And the eyewitnesses said he did. I listened and I said, well, how do I know what the eyewitnesses said? I read it in the Bible. In other words, if you undermine the authority of the Bible, the authority of, the, uh, of all of the witnesses, so it kind of sent up a, a red flag. Now listen, I want to be very clear. I know what Andy was trying to say, and I want to be charitable with that because I would want another brother in Christ to be charitable with me. Here is what Andy Stanley was trying to say. He was trying to say, listen, when you're talking to somebody about your faith in Jesus, they're going to come back and they're going to say, yeah, I mean, I get it, but I'm sorry, I just can't go along with the idea that there was a magical garden with a talking snake. I can't buy that. I can't believe that the Red Sea actually opened up and people walked across it, or that Elijah took his cloak and whacked the Jordan and it, and it parted. I can't believe that a guy spent three days alive in the belly of a fish. I just can't buy it. And what Andy is saying is, you don't have to try to prove the historicity of something that you could never prove because it's a supernatural event. Go to the resurrection of Jesus, lay out the evidence, and say, this is what you need to understand. This is Andy Stanley's line, and he uses it all the time, and he's right. If a guy has the power to bring himself back from the dead, then he's worth listening to when he claims to be the Son of God. Well, that's true. I don't argue with that. But notice something else Jesus said. The Pharisees are getting ready to stone Jesus for blasphemy. They say, Jesus, you have called yourself God, and therefore that is blasphemy, and we're going to stone you. And Jesus responds to them, and he says this. John records it. He says, is it not written in your law, your Old Testament, that you accept? Is it not written there by the author, I have said you are God's? So if he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, the guy that you trust was inspired by God to write these words, he referred to you as gods, and scripture cannot be broken. Whoa, what has just happened? This is huge. Go back to what Andy Stanley said. If a man rises from the grave, he is will he's good enough, he's worthy of being listened to when he claims to be the son of God. I say the same thing. He's worthy of being listened to when he affirms the authority of the Old Testament, which he just did. The word of God came to those teachers, those writers, those people that you trust, and Jesus says scripture can't be broken. What is he referring to? He's referring to the Old Testament. If Jesus can be trusted because he rose from the grave to be the savior of humanity, he can be trusted when he affirms the authority of the scriptures. In other words, a Christian church will teach the Bible because it is trustworthy. And why do I know that? Because Jesus said so. That's how I know. That's a Christian church. Characteristic number two of a Christianish church. A Christianist church declares the inherent goodness of man. It acknowledges our flaws and how they keep us from being all we could and should be, but promises that we can get there by believing and thinking the right things. It's designed for and appeals to people looking for positive reinforcement, for empowerment, for motivation, for those wanting to hear that the universe and its God is on their side. 
Characteristic number two of a Christianist church, make sure you get this and understand it, it declares the inherent goodness of man. At our very core, we are good people. Yes, there are flaws that we develop, and how do we develop them? Maybe we're abused, maybe we're mistreated, maybe we've been hurt, we've gone through something, and so these flaws have added to us, and it's made us become bad people. But if you boil us down to who we basically are at our root, we're good people, the inherent goodness of man, which means you need to come forward, and you need to leave at the altar all of that fluff, all of that stuff stuff that's been added to you. Throw it off on Jesus, and then you can get back to who God intended you to be. That's what a Christianist church will teach. It promises we can get to what we could and should be if we just think and say the right things. Positive thinking is what we need. Look in the mirror and affirm yourself on a daily basis. The power of positive thinking. Uh, Joel Osteen has written a new book. It's called The Power of I Am. Those of us who are Christians know what I am is. When Moses is getting ready to go back and talk to the Pharaoh, and he says, who should I say sent me? God says, tell them I am sent you. Now, what does that mean? That means, look, you know you've reached the ultimate when you're capable of self-definition. How can a human possibly describe or define or wrap parameters around God? He just is. That's all you can say. In other words, the phrase I am is about the power and the preeminence and the authority of Almighty God. A Christianist church does not teach it that way. How does it teach it? This way. Now, mine, mine is a different take on it. It is what follows the word I am, I believe you're inviting into your life. So I think a lot of people don't realize it, but play it in their mind. And even sometimes we say it, you know what? You know what? I am slow. I am unlucky. I am, you know, not attractive. And I think we're inviting negative things in. I think we're supposed to say, you know what? I'm blessed. I'm strong. I'm healthy. I'm talented. I think you have to invite the right things into your life. I talk about life, forgiveness, having good attitudes, reaching your dreams, mm-hmm. not just, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of times religion pushes people down. You know what, our, our, our message is a little bit different. It's if God is for you, that uh-huh. you can recover from a fall, you can reach your dreams, you yeah. don't have to live under that, you know, the yeah. guilt of condemnation. Again, positive thinking. It's all about me becoming all I can be, and the way that I do that is simply getting rid of all of this extra stuff that's been added to me and boiling it down to who God created me to be. This is designed for, it appeals to who? People who are looking for positive reinforcement, and in this world, everybody's looking for that. Because this world is miserable. There's all of the pain and the suffering. It's people who want to be empowered, who have been trampled their entire lives. People who are looking for motivation to achieve. They want money. They want success as the world sees it. People wanting to hear that this universe that always seems to be opposed to me, it's actually on my side. That's what a Christianist church teaches. But a Christian church doesn't focus on helping self. Now, we're not here to help self. Jesus, God, never tells us to esteem ourselves. What does he tell us to do? To crucify the flesh. To kill ourselves. That's what he tells us to do. He is, we are to esteem him and to kill self. That's the thing. We become a new creation. What does the word tell us? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You want to get rid of all that nasty stuff in your life? Put it to death and be raised in the waters of Christian baptism to a new life in Jesus. That's the only way to get rid of it because if all you do is just talk over it into the mirror every day, it will resurface at the most uncomfortable, inopportune time. The only way to be rid of the baggage is to leave it in the grave and come forth. That's what a Christian church teaches. Listen, the world needs to know that here at this church, we're not here to fix you. We can't fix you. People will go through some problem in their life. They'll lose a loved one. They'll go through a divorce. Something terrible will happen. And what will they say? They'll say, oh, I got to get to church. I got to get my heart right. I got to get my head right. I need to get to church. As though we can fix you. I can't fix How arrogant of me to think that I can fix you when I have the same problem that you have. I can't fix myself. I, can, I certainly can't fix myself. I can't fix you either. What is the problem? The problems are sin nature is what it is. Now, it manifests in different ways. Somebody here might be same-sex attracted. Somebody else might be addicted to pornography. Somebody else here might lie all the time. Some, I, I don't know what, how it manifests, but at the root of all of it is what? It's our sinful, selfish nature. That is our problem, and we can't fix it. A Christian church acknowledges that. Only God can fix you, and it requires a complete overhaul. You ever jacked something up so bad that the only thing you can do is just tear the whole thing down and rebuild it? Talk to my dad about the time he put a tape deck into my old brown Forenza. It was, I got a new tape deck, I wanted it in the car, and dad said, oh, I can do it and save us money because I took electrics in 4-H. This guy... 
This guy was out there for nine hours, and he comes into the house, and I'm sitting in the living room, and Mom can vouch for this. He is mumbling and grumbling, well, you should have been happy with what you had because nothing works now. And I go out there. The windshield wipers are on 24-7. They won't turn off. You can turn the radio on whether the key's even in the vicinity. The turn signals don't work because they've been wired to the trunk release. It was the most unbelievable thing. The mechanic just laughs and realizes he's got to tear the whole thing down and rebuild it. That's us. There's no external fix that we can apply to you to make your life better. All we can do is tear you down to the very bottom and let Jesus rebuild you. We find fixing in death and resurrection. That's how we do. Look, this is what Philippians tells us. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. That's what we're after. Scripture is clear. Listen to me. God does not want you to come forward and leave at the altar what you believe are your faults. No. You know what he wants? He wants you to come forward and leave what you arrogantly believe to be your strengths. He wants it all. Every little part of you. He wants your will so he can break it and conform it to his. He wants your mind so he can transform it to a new way of thinking. He wants your spirit so he can renew it. And he wants your heart so he can regenerate it. Everything about you he wants to redo. That's what a Christian church teaches. Characteristic three, Christianish. Here it is. The core testimony of a Christianish church is the unfinished work of humanity. Its most common message is works. Its most recognizable identity is community service. Its most familiar characteristic is a noticeable effort to reflect the culture as a means to attracting the culture. It talks almost exclusively about what society is talking about, drawing its inspiration from and focusing its messages on the interests of the masses. A Christianist church, don't miss that, the core testimony of a Christianist church is the unfinished work of humanity. What we need to be doing to bring Jesus to the world. What we need to do in order to save humanity. It is most notable. You will find a Christianist church all over the community. Wearing their t-shirts from their church. Doing all kinds of wonderful acts of service. I'm not condemning acts of service. We'll get to that in a second. Obviously we engage in acts of service. But it is not our core identity. It isn't what we're all about. The primary focus of a Christianist church is personal service. And there is little if any reference to personal holiness. Everybody's on their own journey. And we're not here to tell you how to live your journey. We are here to tell you that you can go out and serve people like Jesus did. And it's going to give you a good feeling about yourself. In other words, here's what they interpret. If we can earn the esteem and the appreciation of man, we go out and do things for men, then they will think highly of our Jesus. And that is what pleases God. That's a Christianist church's philosophy. But a Christian church understands our core testimony is not our unfinished work. Our core testimony is the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what we proclaim. We cannot earn our salvation and we cannot impress God with our deeds. We do not receive salvation because we merited it. You can go out and serve the community every day for your entire life. And if that's all you do, you will go to hell. Uh, That's strong, that's forceful, but that's the truth. And a Christianist church will not mention that truth. A Christian church focuses on pointing all men to the saving grace that is in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. Again, that doesn't mean we don't engage in acts of service. What it does mean is that is not our sole purpose. We are more than a charitable organization here. We exist for a greater cause. We're more than just a food pantry for people to come and get food. Why do we serve humanity? So that we have credibility to share with them something that is far more important. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our service is a means for sharing the story of salvation. Christ is going to receive the glory for our work. This isn't about us. It's not about drawing attention to Jerome and trying to increase our ranks. It's about making Jesus famous. His name is attached to everything that we do. Because he is what we are all about. A Christian church is not primarily about service. A Christian church is primarily about Jesus. And any church that is primarily about Jesus is going to be motivated to act like Jesus. You see how this works? Yeah, one follows another. We focus on Christ, and because of our love and devotion to Christ, we will do these acts, giving him the glory as we go. And finally, characteristic number four, 
get this, of a Christianist church. A Christianist church is noticeably disinterested in doctrine. It notes the typically smaller size of churches that focus on theological accuracy and commends a broader approach as more appealing. They consider big-picture Christianity to be more attractive to the lost. It teaches that the core message of Jesus was love, and therefore, marketing to the culture how loving it is as a body of believers is the essence of their mission. Noticeably disinterested in doctrine. It's basically summed up in the words of Richard Niebuhr, a Christian ethicist. Uh, if you... If you're at a Christianist church, you're going to notice something. It's preaching a God who has no wrath, who is bringing men who have no sin into a kingdom with no judgment through the ministrations or the work of a Christ without a cross. You're going to notice at a Christianist church, there's no mention of the wrath of God. There's no mention of the sin of mankind. There's no mention that there is a coming kingdom of which there is a just and a holy God who's going to lay down the hammer. There is no mention of the cross of Jesus. No, God is portrayed as all love, no wrath. Man is portrayed as basically good without a sin nature. And if there is one, we don't talk about it. Heaven is a place for everyone because we can't conceive of a God who loves us the way God loves us, who would then punish people that he created for eternity. The glory of Christ isn't his sacrificial blood. We're not going to talk about the blood and the death. We're not going to hit you over the head with that. No, we're going to talk about Jesus' exemplary life. In other words, Jesus becomes Gandhi follow his example. Do what he did. It's funny because Gandhi himself once asked this question, isn't it more important to do what Jesus wants us to do than to call him Lord, Lord? That is in essence the the testimony of a Christianist church. It's a lot more important for us to teach you how to behave and act like Jesus than it is for you us to teach you that he needs to be Lord of your life and you need to sacrifice and submit everything to him. It's all, I always wanted to ask Gandhi, I never got the opportunity to talk to the man, but I would have loved to have asked him, isn't one of the things that Jesus wants us to do, call him Lord, Lord? I'm pretty sure he wanted us to submit to his lordship. So we're not really doing what Jesus wants us to do if we're not calling him Lord, Lord. And yet this is where we are. A Christianist church will proclaim the moral teachings of Jesus, but not his death. A Christian church doesn't see it that way. Why? Herschel York says it this way, if your Christianity simply means Jesus is your example, you're going to hell. Because the example of Jesus condemns you. His death saves you. You can try to be like Jesus, but he's God and you're not. And you will never live up to that standard of being Jesus. Which means your salvation, not going to happen. This is what a Christian church understands. I want to go back to Andy Stanley for a second. Recently on Twitter, Andy Stanley tweeted this out. So what should you look for in a church? Which is good, because a lot of people are looking and trying to understand what do I need to look for in a church. This is what he said. Three things. Number one, people who love Jesus. Number two, people who love like Jesus. And number three, people with a plan to inspire the next generation to love like Jesus. I can't argue with any of that. That's this church. I firmly believe it or I wouldn't be here. That we here love Jesus. That we here love like Jesus. And I believe, you see the teaching, you see the kids' programs, that we have a plan for teaching the next generation how to love like Jesus. Clearly that child is not going to, but it's okay. We can't bat a a thousand. Now anyway, focus. Sorry. Never coming back. All right, anyway. Okay, we, um, what was I saying? Look, we want to do all of those things, but there's a problem. There's a problem here, right? What does it mean to love like Jesus? Uh, it's a great cliched phrase. R.C. Sproul, the Christian theologian, look at what he said. I love this. When a person says, all I need to know is Jesus, doctrine isn't important, we should immediately ask in reply, who is Jesus? Because the moment a person begins to answer that question, the person is inescapably involved with doctrine. In other words, you say I should love like Jesus. All righty. What does that mean? Am I loving like Jesus to tell someone who's caught up in a sinful lifestyle that they need to repent and turn from that? Or is that judgmental? And over here, people will tell me that to love like Jesus is to keep my big trap shut and let people walk their own path and figure out their own salvation on their own terms and just to do good things and to serve them. 
This is loving like Jesus, according to some people. This is loving like Jesus, according to some people. In other words, what does it mean to love like Jesus? I can put that out there and say, yeah, we got to love Jesus, we got to love like Jesus, but what does it mean? You know how you answer the question? Doctrine. And you know how a Christian church is going to answer that question? It's going to tell you how to love like Jesus according to the authority of Scripture. That is how you answer that question. That is what a Christian church understands. What do we do here? Exactly what Bob Eikenberry did this morning. We proclaim the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ to the world unequivocally. The point of this service is not what's happening here. This is the point of this service. Communion, meditating on the sacrifice of Jesus that saved our souls from hell, that is why we gather each week. It's why we do communion each week, because that's the point of what we're doing here. We proclaim what the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. Why? Because all of us, like sheep, had gone astray. Every single one of us had turned to his own way, and we still do. But God laid all of our iniquity on him. That is the proclamation of a Christian church. Here's what we are going to proclaim without hesitation. This is what Jerome Christian Church better be proclaiming to the world. That our sin provoked, look at this word, the just wrath of God. It was justified because of our rebellion. We provoked the just wrath of God and yet inexplicably... The Son of God Himself stepped forward and took all, all of our sin upon Himself. That substitutionary death, He absorbed the just retribution of God for our rebellion in our place. That's why we're here. That's why we're so devoted to this guy, Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate what? Our righteousness? No, his righteousness. That's what you and I will proclaim. I, I think to lay this out for you as we wrap up, the choice before us, it's helpful maybe to depict it in a different way. I want to give you a choice between two different dads. you got a 25-year-old daughter. I'm sorry if this hits home for anybody. A 25-year-old daughter who's unmarried and frustrated. She wants to be married She's had a couple of relationships, but they haven't worked out, and she's discouraged. So dad number one, here's your choice, church. Dad number one decides he is going to help her. He is going to help her get married. So what does he do? He takes out a huge ad in the state's biggest newspaper, and he puts her picture right there. And it's her best picture that he's ever seen of her. And he lists all of her great attributes. All of the things that he thinks will really sell some guy somewhere. And he's careful not to mention anything that he thinks are maybe things that are going to upset somebody. Nothing that would appear to be bad. He only lists the good stuff. That's what he puts there. He makes up some t-shirts. He makes sure that the pictures don't feature her without her makeup on. He has her wear something provocative. He takes a picture of it and puts it up on a billboard with a message, please, someone, come marry this girl. And he lists all of the wonderful things about her. He even offers gifts and incentives, trying to sweeten the deal for anybody who will just say yes. All right, church, when you see that dad, are you going to come away saying, now that is a guy who has a sincere reverence and respect and abiding love for his daughter? Or are you going to say, he's cheapening who she is? He's actually making it seem like whoever chooses her is doing her a favor. All right, dad number two. He wants her to be married. He wants her to be happy. But he has the absolute highest standards for anybody that is interested in his little girl. I mean, we're talking if you want his approval background checks and polygraph tests... We're talking filling out applications in triplicate. You're going to submit drug tests. You're going to submit references. There are probably hidden cameras involved. This guy is serious. It is known by every man who is interested in this girl that you better be willing to give her the best of who and what you are. Otherwise, you don't meet, you don't meet the standard. In fact, he doesn't want to hear you say that you love her. He wants to see that you are committed to her. He wants to see that you would be willing to give up your life for her. Which one of these two dads, church? Which one of these two dads would you want to be your dad and your caretaker? I think the answer is pretty obvious. 
so I need to tell you where I am. Here's where I am. I do not want the preaching and the teaching of this church to cheapen the gospel of Jesus Christ just to try to sell people. I don't want to preach cheap grace. In no way do I want to try to sell Jesus to anyone as though he's a commodity for me or for you to sell. That's not Jesus. I don't want to try to make him as palatable as I can to the world. I don't want to try to tamp down things that might upset people and proclaim that so maybe they would be tricked into accepting him. I don't want to make him acceptable to a world that thrives on shallow commitment. You know what I want to do? I want to preach the real Jesus, the true Jesus. And I want to let the world know that it is our privilege to be his followers. That's what a Christian church does. That's what I want this church to do. I don't know where you are, but maybe you need to make that commitment to him. And maybe you need to join a church that is committed to that. This is your time. Would you come as we stand and as we sing?